Hi, I'm Dale Machek, Chairman of the Econ Program at Northwood University. And this is Northwood University's Freedom Seminar. It is a symposium in which we apply the uh, philosophy of the Northwood idea to current issues and events. And this year we are talking about COVID and coping with COVID. And uh, obviously there's a lot of controversy. Uh, what is the uh, proper political response to this disease? How do we protect the uh, public safety and balance that against other considerations? And to hear, here to talk to us today about these issues uh, with a talk asking whether or not perhaps the, the cure is worse than the disease itself, we have Professor Alex Takarov. Takarov uh, is a professor at Northwood University in the economics department. Uh, he is coming to us from Bulgaria today, where he is originally from. He grew up in a uh, communist society, and uh, that has obviously had an impact on, on his opinions about uh, issues like this. Um, he is, uh, I'm sorry. Um, he got his PhD in economics from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, where he received the annual dissertation research award. He's taught more than 20 different courses in economics, business, philosophy, and history at six colleges and universities since the fall of 2000. The author of more than 300 publications in both English and Bulgarian on classical liberal ideas, uh, labor, environmental issues, regulation, trade, religion, morality. A frequent guest lecturer, he has presented his research in more than 50 forums and has won such prestigious awards and scholarships from uh, the University of Sofia and many others. And he is the editor of Bulgarians, of the Bulgarian translation of uh, Hans Hopp's Democracy, The God That Failed. He's uh, been a frequent peer, uh, guest on Bulgarian national TV, Bulgarian national radio, and Bloomberg Bulgaria, and has appeared in several Bulgarian magazines. So please welcome Professor Alex Sakharov. Hello. Hi guys, do we have a connection? Yes, go yes, ahead, Alex. Okay. Excellent. Well, um, as um, as I've already told Dale, I'm right here in this uh, tiny bedroom in a tiny one bedroom apartment where my mom lives currently. I grew up here. Uh, this is uh, the south part of Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, uh, near a mountain that I love to visit. Unfortunately, um, I won't have that chance for two weeks. As soon as we uh, got off the plane uh, at the airport in Sofia, we were detained. Uh, that is, we were given two hours to get a taxi cab and to get to my mom's place where we will be locked uh, for two weeks without uh, testing us to verify that we are contagious and a threat to the public health. Uh, we are simply uh, locked uh, under uh, some uh, order from a minister of health who has no medical degree. So that's that's where I'm coming from right now. So this is the apocalypse? Meh, I was kind of expecting zombies, not toilet paper shortages. Come on guys, this is a respiratory virus, not a taco. I give all credit for this lecture to the hardworking Northwood University students. They dug up all the information in four of my courses. Some of my comparative economics students are international. Special thanks to our econ majors who went above and beyond, as always. One of them provides the tech support today. The talk is pre-recorded in case we have glitches in the live connection. 
It puts together facts and analysis from hundreds of sources. And I promise not to sugarcoat anything. My advice for this lecture, don't let your feelings cloud your reason. I'm waiting online to answer any questions in real time, in writing. Let's start with a quote and a question. Ready? We must spend whatever it takes to stop the coronavirus death. Do you agree or disagree? Write down your answer. Within an hour, you'll find out why your answer was wrong. All you have to do is keep an open mind. Northwood University is a special school. Our students acquire special skills to address special challenges. We believe in the power of free people to solve big problems. To achieve this outcome, we require that all majors learn economics. What distinguishes the economist is the ability to see the unseen. Most people will either scoff at such a statement or misunderstand it. So let me qualify my words right away. Economists don't have crystal balls to tell us how deep this recession will be. By the way, it's not really a recession. What we have is state governments shutting down large segments of the economy. Harakiri on an economy that was in a fabulous shape less than three months ago. I can read in tarot cards when the stock labor or oil markets will bounce back. Economists can look at the stars and draw predictions. We have no idea about the effectiveness of monetary and fiscal stimuli. Will they restore consumer and business confidence and jumpstart the economy? The right answer is, I don't know. Some economists may tell you that they can use econometrics to provide answers. They're fooling themselves and you. The best among us shouldn't even bet on what will happen with toilet paper in 2020. We are all in uncharted waters. I feel like Alice in Wonderland. How many of you thought they'd see negative prices for oil or mayors dumping tons of sand over their skate parks? I started preparing this lecture right after spring break. Since then, I have been forced to update my notes on a daily basis. We learn in real time the way economists learned in the 1930s. After the dust settles, textbook chapters will be rewritten, and the new chapters will be refuted and revised again years later. Fortunately, economics has a firm foundation even in the most turbulent times. Human nature and economic laws are immutable. The most productive approach in this environment is to adopt the Austrian method. Let me explain what that means. The first question is, how do humans come to possess knowledge? Economists can borrow the method used by physicists. Natural scientists discover the laws of nature by observation. Economics is a priori science. The Austrian method does not rely on sensory experiences. By virtue of being human, we have knowledge of the essence of human choices. That is all we need for the deduction of all knowledge about human behavior. We need no special experience to comprehend the truth. Economics is logical analysis of our inherent knowledge of human action. Economics knowledge is in us, just as in the field of mathematics. We start with the concept of human action and its implications. Do you want to prove that my conclusions today are wrong? Follow my chain of reasoning. Identify a step where I have made an invalid deduction. Mathematicians do not base their discipline on empirical observations. Neither should economists. It does not mean that we can acquire such knowledge locked in a closet. A man who knows no money is unlikely to develop explanations of inflation. We need experiences to gain knowledge, but we need no empirical data in deriving results about triangles or money. You must endorse or reject my explanations purely by thinking them through. 
The most important lesson in economics is that all our choices have opportunity costs. Did your instructor establish this conclusion through empirical observations? No, he helped you see why as a logical implication of thinking like an economist. The major insights in economics may be illustrated by statistics and case studies, but we have learned them through introspection and thought experiments. The end of science, notes Mises, is to know reality. Theory must be guided by what's relevant to us. Experience is useful in determining what to explore, but it doesn't tell us how to do it. Why did I take you on this short methodological journey? To give you confidence that you already possess the right tools. Now use them to verify or reject my conclusions. Does that picture scare you? Of course it does. It's magnified a million times. I have never seen so many people all over the world freak out simultaneously. And all of it because of a tiny bit of RNA with a fatty overcoat. The lives of everyone is disrupted in unprecedented ways. Much of the pain is economic. So people keep asking me for predictions and solutions. I wish I had the answers for these dystopian times. My guess when things will go back to normal is as good as yours. And economics is not a tool that provides solutions to economic problems. We don't do that even in normal circumstances. And now the world is going through the most abnormal of times. Natural scientists, doctors and engineers can draw a list of achievable projects. Economists can take you a step further. We can inform you about the relevant opportunity costs. What should we do together through the government? That depends on our values and priorities. Experts can't make such decisions for us. So what do I offer that is worth an hour of your time today? I claimed only one superpower, remember? To see the unseen. And now I must reveal what that means. It means exploring trade-offs involved in government responses to the pandemic. Why are they unseen and how do I see them? Most people do not inquire about costs, especially if they are dispersed and delayed. The incantation to reveal the unseen in this case is a very simple one. It has just three words, instead of what? Let's start with a few examples. A decade ago, there was a minor outbreak of E. coli infections in America. A former economist turned pamphleteer exploited the situation. He accused Friedman for his opposition to FDA regulations. It had supposedly endangered the safety of his salad. Personally, I'm happy when there is no bigger news than E. coli or shark attack. The risk from both is less than the danger I face every time I cross a street. And my typical street crossing is very libertarian, thus riskier than average. Such sensation seeking is fine from economically ignorant journalists. But this guy on the right was given a Nobel in economics. He should have known better. The truth in this case is summed up in the most fundamental economics lesson. No free lunch. Do I want my salad safer? Yes. Am I willing to pay for it through higher taxes and prices? This will allow the FDA to check every bag of spinach. Maybe I am. That is only because I can afford it. But it means having to spend billions less on other really important problems. If we want more FDA, fine. As long as we are aware of the following. For the rich, to have safer salad, millions won't be able to afford salad at all. Decreased consumption of salad will kill more people than the occasional E. coli. Here is another example. I like my eggs raw in the chocolate mousse I put on my croissant. And I'd like to be certain that my sky-high carb diet won't give me salmonella. 
more safety is better than less safety, right? Duh. What then would be best? Elementary, my dear Watson, getting as close to absolute safety as possible, right? Wrong. Is there a way to prevent all salmonella outbreaks? Yes. And step one is to kill all the chickens. Is it possible for the FAA to make sure no one dies in plane crashes? Yes, but you have to make sure that no plane ever lifts off the ground. Can the EPA remove industrial pollutants from the air? Yes, we can. A simple solution, ban all manufacturing. We are already doing it. Save the polar bears, ban the farting cows. If you have taken the same econ courses as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you have all the answers. But choosing more safety means killing more people. Put yourselves in the position of the decision makers at the FDA. You have the terrible job of controlling one of the largest American markets. You decide who should live and who should die. What incentives shape your behavior? Evaluate the probability of allowing a bad drug to reach the market compared to the probability of delaying or banning a good drug. Which mistake would you rather make? Yes, your concerns for safety vastly outweigh your concerns for efficacy. What's wrong with that? You would do anything to prevent a new drug from killing a handful of people. Their tragedy will be observed by all through the media. You would sacrifice any number of unseen Americans for the safety of a few. Fact, FDA is deadly. Spoiler alert. Soon you'll see that your government's response to COVID is even deadlier. What is the incentive to release in a timely manner an effective drug for this virus? None. As a bureaucrat, you get no benefits for approving more good drugs. By allowing a new drug, you increase the chances that people will get hurt. Your career will be ruined, your name covered in shame. Yes, the FDA is saving thousands of lives by banning bad drugs. That is which is seen. That which is not seen is the cost of saving those lives. FDA is killing and hurting millions by banning good drugs. Need more convincing? Consider seatbelt regulations. Let's say that two kids can be saved annually with seatbelts on school buses. Should we do it? The knee-jerk reaction is to yell, heck yeah, you can't put a price on a child's life. But we could use the same resources to attract and train better bus drivers. We can design safer bus brakes or place more speed bumps. We could do other things that may result in saving four children's lives per year. Then putting seat belts on school buses kills two children. Now let's apply this lesson to what governments do in the current pandemic. Time to go back to the statement. We must spend whatever it takes to stop the coronavirus deaths. We live in a world of limited resources. Whatever it takes is not infinite. Let's say the government has a trillion dollars worth of resources. Should we spend it to save all 80-year-old patients in 2020? Or is it better to invest it in developing and using a vaccine for 2021? Let's assume that we can slow down the spread of the current pandemic. How? Just as we reacted this year, by shutting down most small businesses. The cost in terms of lost domestic output will be measured in trillions of dollars. Congress passed emergency bills authorizing trillions of new public spending. This will provide temporary relief to tens of millions who lose their income. It's also full of pork. Most of it will be a total waste as was Obama's stimulus. Both bills, 2009 and 2020, showered Big Bird with cash. We could spend the rest of the lecture on that alone. Just look at the billion thrown in the trash can marked Amtrak. But we have bigger fish to fry today. The spending will not compensate for the real damage. 
money is not wealth. Government checks don't magically turn into goods. What do you expect if we cut production in half and double the money supply? Within a year, we could trigger a Venezuelan-style hyperinflation, followed by a reversal of the illegal human traffic across the Rio Grande. And the Canadians will be chanting, build that wall. If the likes of Whitmer can shut you down today, who's going to invest in America tomorrow? So how much should we spend to save each American life? A horrible question. And I must be a horrible person to ask it. A politician would never touch the subject. I am an economist and I have no other choice but to ask it. You're already very uncomfortable, right? I ask you to consider the value of human life. Who wants to do that? Well, insurance companies for one, they won't exist without such calculations. How do you think they price their services? What about an agency charged with public health and safety? They face the same problem. How else can they decide the size and scope of restrictions? After 9-11, Congress established a fund to pay the victims' families. The average payment was about $2 million. The maximum exceeded $8 million. How did they crunch the numbers? Primary factor, future expected earnings. A function of age, education, and job. Aren't all lives worth the same? Not in this world. My adult daughter's life is now worth more than mine. She is likely to be a productive citizen for more decades than I. Thousands have died from the coronavirus in the United States. Thousands more will die before the end of the pandemic. There are low-cost measures we can take to prevent deaths. Sing with me. Wash your hands. Or we can use expensive measures, like closing the non-essential economy, whatever that means. Let's assume that going with the low-cost option causes 100,000 more deaths. That huge number is unlikely, given the experience of places like Sweden. And research shows that, adjusted for population specifics, there is no difference between U.S. states with and without shutdowns. Let's value the average death at the 2 million as we did after 9-11. Let's adjust for the age of the average COVID-19 victim. It's clear that policies which cost more than 100 billion are counterproductive. And the self-inflicted costs of the government responses so far are trillions. Am I being cruel to talk about dollars and cents today? Major crises are not a time for responding emotionally. This is a time for using our brains. If we think with our hearts, we'll make the situation much worse. Our cures will kill many more than the virus, and we'll do it with the best intentions. Think of the loss in liberty by denying people free movement or work. This is not quantifiable, but it may be more costly than the loss of output. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety, deserve neither liberty nor safety. Scaring Americans to death is the fastest way for tyrants to enslave us. Let's briefly examine the idea that some businesses are non-essential. State governors use punitive measures to shut down millions of them. Because you know, better safe than sorry. Entrepreneurs are threatened with fines and loss of licenses. People are ordered to stay home except for emergency situations. But non-essential businesses are part of multiple supply chains. They sustain other businesses listed as life-sustaining. How do we strike a balance? How extreme should shutdowns and shelter-in-place orders be? How long should they last? If everything we do saves just one life, I will be happy. Those are words of New York Governor Cuomo. Do you agree with him? 
I hope that you are by now much smarter than he is. Hospitals need healthcare workers, but these people need access to other non-essential services. Doctors need schools for their children, and those are closed by order. How can doctors go to work if they are forced to care for their children? Pennsylvania's governor included laundromats in his initial shutdown order. But those are essential if you don't have a washer at home. Within a day, the administration reconsidered. Laundromats stayed open, along with coal mines, hotels, lawyers, accountants, and the timber industry. All of those had initially been subject to shutdowns. Under the best circumstances, policymakers face the knowledge problem. Only prices can coordinate billions of individual market decisions. What is needed, where, when, and how much? No politician knows that. The virus temporarily disrupted all markets. But pain produces innovation. Entrepreneurs are quickly adapting and finding new ways to respond to needs. Our politicians are the ones preventing those market adjustments. Government orders lead to the meltdown of normal life. Leading medical experts warn of long-lasting and calamitous consequences, of monumental collateral damage to our society and economy. The grotesque measures are shattering the life expectancy of millions. Meanwhile, New York City mayor asked people to snitch on their neighbors. KGB style. Los Angeles mayor talks like a Gestapo officer about hunting down violators of curfew. I grew up on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall. I know the signs. I never thought that I would live to see the rise of tyranny in America. There is a dormant Hitler in all of us. And that's why we were given a republic. If we can keep it. How long will Americans tolerate hiding? like rats in sewers. Kudos to Trump for letting states and cities respond to local conditions. If only those servants could see that their cure is killing the patient. Renowned German microbiologist Bagdi describes government restrictions as leading to self-destruction and collective suicide. Michigan Governor Whitner fancies herself a banana republic dictator. She canceled my dentist appointment in March. Four weeks later, my tooth broke. My stimulus check won't cover that bill. Mine is an expensive inconvenience. But what about delayed treatments? How many lives are shortened by arbitrary restrictions on cancer patients? You can't get your breast tumor out, but they'll give you an elective abortion. And that's why discontent and resistance is growing across the country. The stock market will bounce back, but many businesses won't. Unemployment, poverty, despair, that's the price of state restrictions. Suicide rates go up as the economy spirals down. Health measures that kill the economy pave the way for a health catastrophe. The editorial board of the Wall Street Journal explains it well. No society can safeguard public health for long at the cost of its overall economic health. The deadweight loss in production will be profound. Some countries will take years to rebuild what their governments destroy today. In a normal recession, America loses 5% output in a year. But the US economy may shrink from the state shutdowns as much as 25%. Don't compare today's economy to the Great Depression or the Great Recession. This second quarter of 2020 is much worse than anything we've ever seen. Some say it's like a giant meteor hitting our planet. But that's not it either. There was nothing wrong with America's capacity to generate wealth in February. The same America is still here today, immobilized not by a virus, but by stupidity. Our own U.S. governors can make China the largest economy by the end of 2020. I lived in Illinois and New York. I never thought I'll get the worst governor in Michigan. Whitmer is like a bomb cyclone, a two-month polar vortex over my state. What, don't like talking about GDP when people suffer?
Okay, then consider the human cost. Think about your father who invested his life in his Midland cafe only to see his customers vanish. Or the retail store employing your mom. Lack of sales shut their doors. Or your sister, a Michigan College graduate with $31,000 in student loan debt who was laid off from her first job. Yes, she can return home and live in her parents' basement. But they just lost their livelihood who will provide for them. How do you measure the human cost of their crushed dreams or the mental health damage from all government restrictions? The politicians are riding to the rescue by writing checks and offering loans. But there is no amount of money that can make up for losses of this magnitude. Early in this crisis, President Trump was vilified for making the same arguments. We lose thousands of people every year to the flu. We don't turn the country off. We lose much more than that to automobile accidents. We didn't call up the automobile companies and say, stop making cars. We have to get back to work. Yes, car crashes are very different from pandemics. And the flu is not like the coronavirus. But we learn from old, deadly problems how to cope with new ones. Trump haters missed the basic point of his analogy. He wasn't suggesting that we handle COVID-19 like a car accident. He's just the first to openly speak about the dilemma. Every 15 minutes, an American dies in a car crash. Many more are severely injured. Half of them are young. Globally, the annual death toll is more than a million. An immense amount of pain, misery, destruction, and death. It will go on every year because cars are legal. You know this. Yet you don't demand banning cars. You could at least vote to reduce speed limits or raise the driving age to 18 or 28. That will save thousands of young lives. What, you don't like my proposals? Why? I'll tell you why. None of you will put it like this, but here it goes. You believe that driving your car is worth all of it. All that death, suffering and destruction. It's worth it so that you can get from home to the gym faster. You know it, but you'll never admit it. You hate to think about it in these terms, but this is your calculus. And you know how to prove me wrong. But don't cars save more lives than they take? If you're sick, you need an ambulance, right? Okay, let's ban all cars except emergency vehicles. This would save lives. Ambulances and fire trucks will move faster without traffic. You support the coronavirus restrictions, but reject my proposals? Then you are a hypocrite. Keeping your lifestyle is worth the lives we can save by taking your car. We make such calculations in both politics and personal lives. Two years ago, my son broke an arm playing soccer. Last year, my daughter broke a foot hiking in a mountain. Should I never let my kids play or walk outside? It would certainly make them safer. As parents, we see the risk as a price worth paying. Kids need freedom and fun. I risk my kids' lives so they can have fun? Sounds insane. But that's the bargain you make every time you let your child go out. Now, what if a child drowns in the sea? The parents would wish they had never taken the kid to the beach. What if a family member dies in a car accident? You'd wish that all cars had been banned. What if your parents died of the coronavirus? You wouldn't care about the economy, would you? You'd be okay with millions falling into poverty to save your loved one. Would you be looking at these issues more ethically in your grief? Should we make all decisions by imagining all possible tragedies? Or should we allow for certain risks? Even risks we would regret if tragedy strikes. Yes, the coronavirus is not like a car accident, but the fundamental question and the calculus is the same. 
No free lunch. Every choice has a cost. Tens of millions died since cars became a necessity. You and I both know that the benefits are worth it. You and I and our loved ones could be among the victims tomorrow. We know that and we are okay with it. And the same should be our response to this virus. Now, there are fun things my kids want to do that are too risky. If more Americans died in cars, a million every year, we may consider a ban. There is a line somewhere. I don't know where and neither do you, but we know that it's well above 35,000 dead Americans per year. What about the coronavirus? If our cars alone are worth 35,000 Americans, what is our whole way of life worth? The risk of ruining the economy against the risk of more sickness. 35,000 dead from the virus is actually a minuscule price for saving the economy. Would you call me a monster? Let the one without sin cast the first stone. Look at your own calculus. You accepted that price just for driving your car. Is your car worth more than your house, job, and retirement savings? Would you give all that up to save 35,000 fellow Americans? And it's not even clear if shutdowns lead to lower death from the virus. Whitmer made it a crime to buy paint in Michigan. Swedish restaurants never closed. Guess which place has more COVID deaths per million? Should we destroy the economy and impoverish millions to save just one life and make Governor Cuomo happy? No, my friend, you won't even ride a bike to Taco Bell for that. And if this virus kills a million Americans without the restrictions, would the destruction of our economy be worth it? I don't have the answer, but this is the question we face. This is the conversation we can't afford to avoid. President Trump noted that everyone is participating in it, whether we like it or not. Every time you drive to Kroger, you take part in this conversation. You just hate putting it in words as I did today. This is the cross that economists must carry. Very few of them have fan clubs. People call ours the dismal science. Love us or hate us, Economists tell it as it is. We don't compete for votes. True economists don't enter to win popularity contests. Our only concern is the truth. Even if, especially if, that truth is as ugly as the one we face today. There is no one else to tell our politicians to react sensibly to events as they occur, to consider all consequences of both acting and letting go. It's a very rewarding profession if you're curious and keep an open mind. And it can also be very frustrating at times. Most individuals are dismally under-equipped to think critically under pressure. When public servants talk of doomsday and demand sacrifices, people panic. Our tendency in times of crisis is to assume the government knows best. A panicking public is like sheep seeking comfort in the wolf's den. In such cases, it's hard for me to convince even relatives and friends. When we face danger, we demand reaction from the government and we push the government to do too much. We the people are guilty of creating incentives for politicians to overreact. In times of crisis, we always demand they do something and we falsely assume that every something is better than nothing. But that's insane. Imagine that you are sick from an unknown disease. Would you want your doctor to give you any randomly chosen medicine or to cut any random part of your body in an attempt to cure you? Most of what the doctor could do will torment and kill you. Let's say you have an untested cure for an unknown disease. Would you say it's smart to administer it to everyone? Just in case the cure works 
and the disease affects the whole population. Better safe than sorry, right? Unfortunately, that's what we demand from the government when we panic. The political logic runs like this. We must do something. This is something. Therefore, we must do it. We swallow the lie that overreaction is preferable to underreaction. The case for overreaction is easy to make. Underreacting may cause preventable deaths. Okay, you say, perhaps our measures are a little extreme, but they prevented a public health catastrophe like the Spanish flu. And how do you know that? Can you test your hypothesis in a controlled environment? Whatever the death toll at the end, the wolves will tell you. It would have been much worse without our restrictions. Are they right? There is no data that can answer that one. So unlike me, they can never be proven wrong. And for the unthinking masses, that's as good as being right. Perhaps we can protect a few thousand elderly and infirm from this virus. What about the tens of millions of small entrepreneurs and low wage laborers? They are the victims of overreaction. Concerned about inequality? The COVID restrictions lead to concentration of wealth and power. We'll end up with an economy that is more centralized and fragile, will be less flexible and adaptable, and that will cost millions of lives. Worse, we are falling in love with our jailers. It's the Stockholm Syndrome. We'll be calling more often for more government solutions. We'll expect more aid for the impoverished by the overreaction. We'll have different, un-American values. Here I'm reminded of two quotes. The government, is good at one thing. It knows how to break your legs and then hand your crutch and say, see, if it weren't for the government, you wouldn't be able to walk. The second one, everyone is a socialist in a pandemic. When you overreact, it affects you and a few others around you. When a government overreacts, it affects everyone. And it doesn't care what sorts of risks you might be willing to take. If a government overreacts, the individual is at a great disadvantage. I'm a relatively healthy middle-aged man. I prefer to take my chances with the virus. I'd rather avoid the ruin of this economic harakiri. But I am constrained by the system's lack of flexibility. To hammers like Whitmer, every problem is a nail. Government offers only one size fits all measures, and such measures fit no one. A crisis is a time when we need more reason, but all we get is more passion. We don't have enough experience with threats like this one. The mass media has promoted mass hysteria. That is why today reason is discarded as lack of compassion. People are scared and they would trust any fraud who offers a cure. That's how we impede herd immunity among the young and healthy. This lockdown is not saving lives. It prolongs and exacerbates the problem. On March 20th, the French published a major controlled study. It shows no excess mortality from coronavirus compared to other flus. But we live in a secular age and the success of capitalism has spoiled us. For the atheists, this life is all they get. Many regard death from a virus as an intolerable insult. This pandemic reminds us that we are mortal and fear is normal. Even for Christians, you know the joke. Everyone wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die. Is this virus bad? Well, it's not a walk in the park. Many parks are closed. And there's anecdotal evidence that COVID eats brains. Look at what Michigan's governor and the mayors of New York City and Los Angeles did in April. I could fish from my kayak or sailboat, but not if I install a tiny motor in it. I could buy cucumbers, but purchasing seeds to plant them was bioterrorism. My dentist was forced to treat my broken tooth like a televangelist. 
But at least my governor allows me to buy dope and forget about it. Hey, Whitmer, my kid cemented my tooth without a license. What you gonna do about it? You call yourself progressive? Then consider this. When several governors are leading in the wrong direction, he who stops first makes the most progress. Is the virus as horrible as Stephen King's imagination? I don't think so. But the media loves to focus on corpses instead of survivors. Could you imagine a headline that reads, 0.1% of Americans may die from coronavirus in the worst case scenario? Of course not. The truth doesn't sell. Blood sells. Death sells. Our brains are wired to respond to danger. It's a survival mechanism. Opportunistic politicians and sensationalist journalists know it, and they thrive on it. Jedi Master Yoda warned us about it. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to overreaction. Overreaction leads to suffering. Trump is right. The real enemy of the people is the fake news media. Did you hear about the one-day-old Louisiana baby who died of COVID? How would that make you feel if you were pregnant? You and all of your relatives will support any radical political restriction. The real story? A woman went to the hospital with COVID symptoms. There, she delivered her baby halfway into her pregnancy. The authors of such fake news should be treated as terrorists. The media is in effect crying bomb on a plane. And as Dr. Hanold suggests, we should all get a cranial rectalectomy. Time to pull our heads out of our butts and look for the truth. Collective overreacting has profound social and economic effects. Today we need calm judgment more than ever. I'm a professor. I make my living by sharing my knowledge. I can serve my customers from home. My biggest loss is the closing of the pool. What about the people who are forced not to serve me, the lifeguards? Suddenly they can't pay the rent. They may not even have money for groceries. And American farmers are forced to destroy huge amounts of food. Restaurants outlawed, slaughterhouses shuttered, farmers drowning chickens. We watched such movies before, thanks to presidents FDR and Carter. Meanwhile, United Nations experts predict a global famine of biblical proportions. For most people on earth, losing their business or job is far more devastating than the risk of getting infected with the stupid virus. As a Christian, I support the government when they quarantine the sick. The Bible delegates these powers because such measures save lives. Quarantining the healthy, however, is unqualified evil. The Coast Guard is chasing pedal surfers and moms are being arrested for playdates. Undercover cops are busting hairdressers, and drones are dispersing people. The communists were less sadistic when the Berlin Wall fell. America is being destroyed from within. You are guilty until proven innocent. It's as despicable as FDR quarantining all Japanese Americans during World War II. The Bible also forbids confiscating tools of trade even to settle debts. It does so because taking your livelihood is tantamount to taking your life. The government promises to replace our livelihoods with handouts, but most governments are insolvent by any sane accounting standards. They can't save their economies with bailouts. 
it's their policies that create massive economic dislocations. So what do we do? We engage in conversations as the one started by President Trump. That's what we do today at Northwood University's Freedom Seminar. Sound decision making requires a cost benefit analysis. It will make us uncomfortable. Who wants grandma to die when it could have been prevented? How are we to choose between mortality rates and unemployment rates? What demands should the boomers make upon the millennials? We have to use our brains, not our hearts, for thinking. Saving one life can't justify burning our economy to the ground. Shall we do it for a million lives? These are nasty questions to raise. You can avoid asking them, but the answers will be given with or without you. We unleashed a process of economic destruction on America. It will cause widespread long-term damages if we don't reverse it quickly. And let's not forget that it's 2020. We are less than six months away from the elections and the stakes are huge. The panic fueled by the mass media has political goals. Much of the so-called news are attacks on candidates. For the left, the pandemic is an unqualified blessing. Governors took a hammer and sickle to the economy. The stock market crash expropriated the billionaires. Capital allocation has been nationalized. We move towards socialism. Even the empty shelves in grocery stores prove it. His mission accomplished? Bernie retired. And because of the crisis, no one pays attention to Biden's mental health. Trump's economic boom is reversed just when it, his enemies hoped. CNN, MSNBC, PBS, and the rest gloat while faking concern. Populists are also trying their best to profit from the crisis. It's great for promoting anti-immigration and anti-free trade ideas. Meanwhile, anyone who benefits from chaos in America celebrates. China's Communist Party, Putin's mafia, Iran's jihadist rulers, Kim's family business in North Korea, and every terror group on the planet. They love what our politicians are doing to America in response to the virus. They love how the American left undermines the American president. Trump has been teased again and again to take total control of all restrictions. Because, you know, better safe than sorry. Yet the president is letting the states manage their affairs. Therefore, the mainstream media claims Trump is a threat for America. The left wants us to believe that we'll die without absolute government control. They always sacrifice moral considerations for political expediency. That's why the leftists love to spread fears. And that's why we can't let them crush our liberty, hoping to gain more safety. I leave you with a cautionary quote. Of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims maybe the most oppressive. It would be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. Oh yes, Almost forgot it. Epstein didn't kill himself.
Hello. Hello, Alex. Uh, so we have a, a method for doing the Q&A here. Uh, at sure. the side of your screen or at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little icon. I I'm sorry, what? I see the questions by Logan and Sarah, both excellent questions. Okay. So go ahead and uh, why don't you answer the, those questions, but make sure you read the questions before you answer them. Not everybody uh, knows where to find them, so. Absolutely, yes. So Logan is asking, when you discuss the value of human life, there is a logical and mathematical figure that we can find that gives us a maximum cost worth spending on COVID. Aside from re-election bids, why do you think it is so hard for politicians to understand this logic? That is an excellent question. And uh, at the beginning of the uh, presentation, I said, uh, write down your answer. I wasn't expecting that students will actually reveal what they thought uh, on the chat uh, connection, uh, on the chat link. But I saw three of them gave the right answer. I was assuming that uh, almost everybody would be giving the wrong answer. Uh, why are politicians giving the wrong answer? Why are most people giving the wrong answer? Well, the short answer to that question is because they don't go to Northwood University. They never learn the skills that our students learn. They don't learn how to think as economists. They don't know how to evaluate the trade-offs. This is what I was explaining at the beginning of the lecture. But it's not just politicians whose job is, of course, to be popular. Of course, a politician is going to exploit any situation and present himself as a champion for people who are suffering. And it's easy to see those who are suffering from the COVID uh, virus. Uh, what uh, the people here in Bulgaria were shown a couple of months ago was um, footage from some town in northern Italy where the local governments and their broken healthcare system made a huge mess. So they couldn't handle it, right? And so the TV channels here, the national TV was showing uh, corpses that were waiting to be buried. And of course, this is going to spread fear. And of course, people are going to want the government to do something quick without asking about what the costs are. Uh, I've been here for three days now in Bulgaria and I had the opportunity to uh, frustrate uh, almost every one of my relatives, my mom, my uncle, my cousin, my friends, and I'm talking to everyone. And those people, and I'll connect this question to the next excellent question by Sarah. Uh, she was asking, uh, can you touch on what you mean when you compare this to the Stockholm syndrome? The Stockholm syndrome is a term that psychologists are using uh, after I believe some kind of a airplane hijacking uh, in Stockholm, and the uh, terrorists hijacked the plane, and by the time the police apprehended them, it turned out when they interviewed the hostages that they had already developed uh, good feelings, uh, friendships, even maybe falling in love for some of their uh, some some of the people that took them hostage. Uh, that's what I'm observing here with, with everyone, almost everyone in Bulgaria. Uh, I haven't had the chance to talk to as many people in um, Arita. I was doing research based on my students' uh, homework. And here in Bulgaria, I had plenty of time because as soon as I arrived, we were herded through the airport like uh, the Jews were herded when they were uh, getting off those uh, horse carriages and being pushed into Auschwitz. So we were going through a process that uh, eerily resembled this, and they shipped us to our uh, parents' places, and they told us that we cannot leave those places for a couple of weeks. And I'm talking to everyone because I have so much time now. I can't go out hiking in the mountain as I would naturally do uh, as I visit Bulgaria, and I've been talking to everyone, and I noticed a person after person, my, my friends, my family, everybody is so uh, happy that the government acted so quickly, that they shut down everything. I have friends who are working all in the private sector and their companies suffer tremendously. I have a friend from high school and he's a, a businessman, he's an entrepreneur, he has several companies that he founded. One of them has to do with importing fireworks from China 
and doing uh, fireworks shows for all kinds of events. And that company is basically run into the ground by government restrictions. And these people, can you believe that? They love their oppressors. They love the government. I mean, this is unbelievable how people can focus on one scare and never think about the, the spillovers, the consequences, the trade-offs, the costs that they themselves are seeing, that they are paying. Yet they fear that this thing is so, so bad that everything is permissible, that they should just write a blank check to the government to do whatever they want. So, Alex, um, we're, we're waiting for the questions to come in. I, I will wonder if um, you had mentioned that after correcting for certain factors, there's no evidence that the mortality rate is any different between states that have shut down and states that haven't shut down. I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit, uh, because there's obviously raw statistics. For example, Sweden has a much higher death rate, for example, than its Scandinavian neighbors. Um, yes. And, and there's clearly some states that have much higher death rates than their, their other neighbors. So if, if, if you could um, explain that uh, comparison that you made, Yes, that was actually, again, everything that I have presented today is thanks to the hardworking students at Northwood University who did a lot of research in the couple of months after uh, spring break, and they supplied me with a lot of data. There was one place uh, where people were uh, crunching the numbers and putting together information about states with and without restrictions. And, of course, they were... Uh, making uh, room for the fact that some of those states that did not lock down, they are in the uh, Midwest and they are sparsely populated. They don't have big cities like Detroit in our state, like Chicago, like New York or LA or Houston or Miami that are badly hit. Uh, so they made allowance for the fact that population is much more scattered. They don't have big concentrations of people. They adjusted for the wage and all other kinds of demographics. And they found that there is absolutely no effect within the United States, nothing visible, at least in their model, that could show that these restrictions have done anything to uh, lower the death rate. Um, when, when you mention uh, Sweden, this is one of my best examples. And while it is absolutely true, I've been following the data twice a day, in the morning and in the evening, because the data comes every day uh, from uh, all kinds of countries in different time zones, and I'm trying to stay current with all the numbers. And yes, if you compare Sweden to its neighbors, Norway, Finland, Denmark, Sweden has a much higher death rate per million. That is absolutely correct. So what I did here, I was comparing Sweden to... Uh, our state where we lock down up just about everything and it turns out that Sweden has a much much lower death rate per 1 million in our state of Michigan which is comparable both as climate and uh, we have one big city they have one big city so in many ways Sweden and Michigan are comparable uh, and yet uh, Michigan has about 50 percent higher death rate per million than Sweden, and Sweden did not close anything. Sweden just appealed to the people for common sense things like keeping social distance, washing their hands, uh, keeping their elderly uh, safe if possible. That's the only thing, by the way, that they uh, ultimately acknowledged that they didn't do quite so well. Uh, they did not manage to provide sufficient protection for some of the elderly people in, I assume, just like uh, Cuomo allowed for infected people to come and to infect uh, hundreds of uh, people in, in, in the homes, in the elderly homes in New York, something similar must have happened because their minister acknowledged that their only failure so far has been that they could not protect their elderly enough. But the death rate among those uh, young people who are out there visiting each other, sitting in the city, uh, open spaces and uh, eating in restaurants and uh, cafes. Uh, the, the death rate there is so minuscule, it's amazing. I've been crunching the numbers here in Bulgaria where everybody, as I said, is in love with the general uh, who is uh, giving the advice and the uh, minister of health who has no medical degree 
that issues uh, orders twice a day at least uh, that contradict each other all the time and they impose something they repeal it all the time and so i've been crunching the numbers and i looked at how many people have died bulgaria has a little bit below seven million people right now the population is decreasing because of low birth rates and many people like me have chosen to find uh, their happiness somewhere so what happens in bulgaria is we have about a hundred people who died of COVID. Plus, there is the doctor who is the, in charge of the uh, clinic of infectious diseases for children, who said none of those 105, I think is the number today, none of those 105 people that died in Bulgaria in those two months, that's less than two people a day that have died, that I don't know how it justifies anything that has been done to the Bulgarian people, but he said none of those is a death from COVID. And I keep hearing this from doctors all over the world. None of those is a COVID. If they had stuck to the rule how to uh, fill in the death certificate, none of those would have been a COVID attributed because these are people who are 80 years old, people who had cancer, people who had severe heart uh, disease, all of these cases that have died. And I assume this is the vast majority of the cases in the United States in Europe, if COVID was treated on the death certificates the way a flu is treated, almost no death will be reported from this virus because almost everyone who dies has a lot of complications that would have been written as the primary cause. When a virus like the common seasonal flu hits you, what doctors do, if you have like developed pneumonia, uh, from the virus, you start with the virus, you develop pneumonia, what they write in the death certificate from a, a, a normal year when the flu hits and kills many more people, by the way, that have died so far, is what they write is he died of pneumonia. If the person had cancer treatment before that and the cancer was advanced and they were expecting the guy to die within a couple of years, they write cancer. If the guy's eight years old, they write death from old age. This is what was the normal practice. Somebody decided that COVID would be treated in the medical certificates in a completely different way. They put it right there with the plague, with the Ebola, with anthrax. And this totally freaked out everybody because now everyone morning and evening, like me, is following those numbers. Turns out that none of these numbers are capturing people who actually died of COVID. Healthy young people who get, get COVID, well, more than half of them will never know that they had it. 98% of the registered cases in the world right now, they have mild to no symptoms. Only 2% have severe cases of something that probably is combined with uh, all the other factors that I mentioned that are typical for the victims of COVID. And the survival rate from this virus so far in Bulgaria, and I decided, let me double it. Our peak here in Bulgaria is long behind us. And, and I decided, well, let's double the number of people. Let's say that by the end of this whole thing, and I will just uh, generously assume that they are COVID victims. Let's say that we double the number of dead and I crunch the numbers. Turns out that the survival rate from COVID in Bulgaria, where people praise the government for keeping them in a concentration camp, that people have survived at a rate of 99.997%. That is if we assume that the victims will double. And if we allow for the way that the statistics is being taken by doctors, there is a, a, a person who was interviewed on TV who said, oh, one of my relatives died and the doctor in the hospital, they asked me, can we write that he died of COVID? They hadn't even done the test. They said, can we write he died of COVID? Why? Well, because we'll be paid more. And, and this is something I hear is happening not only in Bulgaria, Okay, when then in Bulgaria, of course, everything is corrupt. In the hospitals and, and everywhere else, you, you try to get their attention. You have to give them money under the table in most of the cases. They have wonderful doctors, but it's a, it's a horrible healthcare system. Okay, I just want to make one more observation before moving on to the next question. Uh, you said that uh, Sweden hadn't restricted anything, but you know, I, I don't think you meant to say that, right? Because the, there have been restrictions. The colleges are closed. The uh, there's a limit to the number of people that can patronize a, a bar or restaurant in a given time. So yeah. um, I just wanted to, to make that observation before we move on to the next question. <clears throat> so a, a prelude to the next question. Uh, 
we represent ourselves. When we appear at the Freedom Seminar, uh, so when students ask us what we think about X, Y, and Z, we don't represent Northwood University. This is a nonpartisan institution. But Alex yeah. has asked you uh, what what could could be construed as a political endorsement. Um, in the absence of a qualified libertarian candidate for president, would you support uh, the re-election of Donald Trump? <clears throat> When was the last time they had a qualified candidate? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> would I uh, support President Trump? Uh, well, I, I only voted once um, back in 2016 uh, for a president. Before that, I was a Bulgarian citizen and did not have an American citizenship, so uh, I did not participate in this game. Um, well, I was thinking, uh, in 2016, whether I should vote for, and, and the Michigan uh, ballot has this write-in option. And I uh, found out that you can write in anyone, and anyone could be qualified uh, as, a, as a presidential candidate if uh, whoever supports him pays, I think, $5,000. I don't know if that's true. That's what they told me, and I saw the list at that time of uh, candidates. Uh, and, and on that list were Mickey Mouse and Buddy the Elf. So I was split between these two. Uh, there are so many things wrong with President Trump. Uh, I don't know where to begin. Uh, but compared to what the alternative is in terms of ideas, uh, well, uh, he seems like, uh, well, a godsend, I have to tell you. Not, not the person, okay? No one of any of my friends who voted for Trump in 2016 liked the guy. I still have to meet someone who actually likes Trump as, as, as a person. Okay? And the uh, majority of the people who voted for Trump at uh, that time were conservatives who wanted a good Supreme Court nomination. Turned out he gave us two wonderful uh, nominations and even with that alone he had uh, completed everything uh, that people expected him to complete. Uh, so will I vote for Trump? Um, I don't know yet. But I don't You're see waiting to see if Mickey Mouse is on the ballot. Yeah, <laughs> I have to check if Buddy All right, let's go to Sarah's it. question. Um, is it true that Sweden tracks its citizens? If they are treated for COVID-19 and test positive, they're quarantined. I have no idea. I haven't checked how they actually handle the sick people, but uh, within my presentation, I said I'm perfectly fine if they had tested me at the airport and if they had discovered that I have the uh, virus, uh, I was okay to even go for uh, two, three more days uh, under lockdown for them to come again and retest me. And if they discover that I am a threat to someone okay, outside of my family, that I should stay under quarantine until I'm clean, until there is absolutely no chance that I, I would do it even if they don't tell me to do it. And this is the right thing to do. Uh, so I don't know what Sweden does, if they uh, are tracking the people who are tested positive, if they are uh, mandatorily quarantining them, kudos to them. This is exactly what a government uh, should be doing. If there are people who are threatened by spreading viruses, these people must be locked down. The people who are vulnerable, they should not be locked down. They should be encouraged to take extra precautions. And the young and the healthy, to quarantine those people, to stop schools because of this, this is beyond comprehension for me. And, and the only people that uh, switched from uh, meeting face-to-face -to, -face to online, because it's easy to do it at the higher level education, is uh, those people in colleges and universities in Sweden. Their kindergartens are working, their uh, elementary, middle school, high school, everybody is going to school as far as I know. They have never even considered closing those because they knew from the start they used, they are the only country, as far as I know, that actually used science and common sense. Everybody else freaked out. Everybody else copied the communist government of China. It's inconceivable. Why would America do what China had done? Why would all of Western Europe do it? Why would they copy these countries instead of making their own decisions? One country freaks out. They see those corpses in, in Northern Italy. Well, everybody goes uh, on lockdown because China had the first uh, incidence of COVID. And they did it, therefore, it must be the right thing to do. I mean, th this is not logic. This is panic. 
Okay. Well, we have no more questions at this time, and we have uh, come to the end of our uh, session. So I, I want to thank you for your observations, and uh, it was an entertaining and informative uh, presentation this afternoon uh, this morning. And uh, I hope you have a good time, and you finally get to climb those mountains at some point while you're in Bulgaria. And this is the first time I'm giving a presentation at a conference in a swimsuit. Thank you for this opportunity. Ha, ha, ha.